So we're moving now to the final stretch, uh, the plenary. And um, so the idea is to bring bring all the, the perspectives together in the form of a dialogue. Um, and, but please um, do keep feeding in questions to the Q&A and we can, we, can, um, we can take note of those. There have been some questions, you know, I guess, understandably listening to the talks, which are, uh, which have really been, really been, I guess, kind of what next type questions um, or pointing towards, um, you know, remedies, solutions, how can one move forward to, better, to a better kind of state of civic health, as, as it were, to sort of row back on or on these on this tribalism or this or this polarization. Um, and I guess we'll we'll need to talk about that. Um, but are there any any any? I mean, one of the things I just just to kick off, one of the things I took Christian from your talk was that you really were emphasising that. Um, the social media revolution is is a revolution and has got great potential to um, inflame uh, styles of thinking, you know, what, 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 what everyone might call them, paranoid, broadly speaking, which can intensify belief or, or um, uh, you know, solidify identities. And I just wondered whether Peter, listening to that, you know, coming from your 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 experience in media, whether you agree with that, whether you think that this, the social media revolution is a revolution with with all the sort of dangers that we we can associate with with rapid periods of social change and the whole phenomenon of atypical or unusual personalities rising up through that in a potentially dangerous way, the potential for dangerous sorts of group psychological processes rather than healthy ones. I mean, we're, we're, clearly, it's 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 a technological revolution. I mean, I don't think there's that's a particular, you know, that's a that's just a given, really. Um, the question then is how turbulent that is, and and you know, how do we mitigate that turbulence? Um, historically, they have always been very turbulent transitions between, you know, between the church and print, um, and all again, always full of great potential and and great dangers. You know, as 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 various kind of norms and identities break. That sort of new, new the, the, the period is very dangerous. So, so it's re it's really ca a case of how one thinks about you know mitigating some of those dangers. Um, and um, so, so um, everything is everything is to play for in a way. We're, we're in this period where we're going through a charge towards regulating the online space. Um, the question is: Is it going to be bad regulation? Is it going to be useless regulation? Or is it actually going to be a sort of regulation that changes things to a positive. Um, people are in the online space talking about interventions that are as big as the intervention of, of the BBC during the 1920s, what would be the digital equivalent of that today, largely in terms of design rather than content. I think we're talking about design more than anything else. So, so look, we've had these big shocks and, and they require big interventions. Um, we just have to realize they have to be at scale. And we have to understand that some of the vocabulary um, that we had to mitigate the problems in the past, which was, you know, a bit of pluralism, a bit of freedom of expression, um, you know, these kind of like, sort of the, the ways we were going to med mediate, the way we were going to sort of soften the totalitarizing potential of mass media, which are kind of things that we came through, you know, in the 20th century, um, those aren't enough anymore. So we've seen freedom of, freedom of expression weaponized against itself in the ways we talked about earlier. We've seen pluralism tip over into, I mean, not just polarization, there's nothing wrong with polarization, but, you know, Nazi style polarization, where there's an in-group and everybody else is inhuman, that kind of polarization. Um, and, and we've seen the idea of public service media shrivel to a real kind of fossil of what it was, just about like NGO information about stuff commercial media don't give you, which is a completely, a completely sort of debauched and impoverished idea of public service media, uh, which needs to be reinvestigated. And, and on top of that, we have a failed metaphor, uh, the metaphor of a marketplace of ideas, which was always bullshit. But, but that's the excuse, isn't it? That's the excuse the far right will use. That's sadly the excuse the New York Times now uses as they have decided to cast off their responsibility of being a newspaper of record. The marketplace will solve it. Well, it won't. Um, so we have to 
renew our metaphors <laughs> and we have to renew our strategy, but, but everything's to play for. Um, the EU Digital Service Act and Digital Action Plan, which set out the digital soul of Europe, was far from perfect, but was the first serious comprehensive attempt to think about this. Um, can I jump in here? Um, right, yes, hear too. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I think that the question, the problem of the digital is that if that's what we're talking about should not be restricted uh, to the uh, to the digital industry itself. It has to be seen as part of a uh, part of a larger series of uh, of questions. Uh, Noam Chomsky, um, uh, I heard him give a talk just a couple of days ago, and I think it's very easy uh, to find on the internet because I think he's given it um, at several places, and I don't remember uh, the title of it. Maybe somebody uh, somebody knows of it. Uh, I know it's being given tomorrow at the New School, uh, some version of it. Uh, but uh, the theme of his, uh, of his talk, you know, which you, you could just say, oh, crazy, uh, uh, etc. You leftists, you know, the, uh, you know, the cartoon where the, the cow says, I've just discovered how they make hamburgers and another cow says, you left us with your conspiracy theories. Um, the, um, you know, the, the theme of his uh, talk is that we're really facing the end of civilization. Uh, and he gives three, um, three um, reasons for that. Uh, the first is climate change. And um, I don't, I, I'm not saying that because I'm not a science, climate scientist and uh, so forth, but the, obviously there are a lot of people who believe that, that if we, you know, don't address that. Um, uh, the, his, uh, the second one is nuclear weapons, um, which, uh, you know, we continue to expand and uh, uh, so forth. And, and, you know, if you look at, uh, the geopolitical situation, uh, I don't think that it's impossible that there's gonna be a war between the US and China or up ahead. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to say. The situation in the United States is, to my mind, uh, is extremely uh, frightening. I mean, we really do have half the country believing that the election was uh, stolen. I mean, this is really quite quite an extraordinary uh, event. And then the third, which is related to that, uh, that Chomsky uh, talks about, um, is something um, that he he's coined a term, and I don't remember the term, it was something like info side or something, the death of rational discourse, the, the uh, impossibility. And the digital is obviously is, is part of that. So I do think that um, we have to situate the question, uh, the questions of mass psychology and the digital and uh, so forth uh, in relation to uh, a larger series of crises that humanity is, is, is really facing because the acceleration of everything since the 70s, uh, the, the speeding up of the use of energy, of the mobilization. It's basically capitalism. You know, it's just, it, it's so intense. It's so, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, we, we need more control over it, democratic control, scientific control, and uh, so with the pandemic as an example. Uh, look how badly uh, we mostly did uh, with, with the pandemic. I mean, it's, it's incredible. You would, you know, Hobbes. If you take Hobbes as the most foundational liberal thinker, you know, self-preservation, self-preservation. You would think that that's pretty easy, you know, to know, to deal with a pandemic. And look at how badly um, we deal we dealt with it in the United States and, and Britain. Yeah. And, uh, if I 
came out well at the end. The coming is coming out better, but Quinton, did you Yeah, so I was just gonna offer an observation there. So um I suppose it, it goes back to the point about what's the nature of the change and to what extent can societies buffer or accommodate change, rapid change. And I think the, in a sense, um, I think one way of thinking about what we, let's take the case of the United States, for example, one way of thinking about that is that the ideas that are now articulated and so widely taken up at one level you can see that there are precedents for them that have been constructed as part of political strategy for many, many years. So, for example, the erosion of faith in government, the discourse about government not working, big government being bad, government being bad. Um, you can also see other ideas in the, in the air, which, you know, the concerns about paedophilia and so on, which are part of culture, and they've become sort of uh, appropriated into these ideas that people have. But I think one real issue here is that I think perhaps um, what is taking many by surprise um, is the phase shift. It, so there's something like a phase change, a step change. It's the rapidity with which new political and ideational dynamics are gaining traction and I think that is that is digitally mediated uh, I mean obviously there's a political context for it and there is a population which in at some level has been sensitized and prepared but um, I think in some ways you can think about Trumpianism as a sort of experiment where the outcome was not known in advance but in actual fact by pursuing the strategy that he's pursued, he has taken it much further and more successfully than many would have predicted or understood. And he is not, he, he's not educated, he's not an educated uh, man, he's not intellectual, but he actually has a profound insight, I think, into marketing and the use of this um the use of this technology is an instinct for messaging and i think it, he has played it successfully very effectively within this context he's exploited the opportunities but of course they're the opportunities within a, a larger context which he inherited and did not invent um but the i suppose what strikes me about this now is First of all, the, the the point that Eli made that others have made is is the actual breakdown. I mean, this is this is really the the outcome of this. I think the loss of trust in official institutions is that is is a fundamental change. It's very difficult to row back from that when people no longer believe the messages that they're receiving from official institutions, because then what then are the warrants for people's beliefs? I mean, so much of what we think about the world is based upon trust, trust, placing trust in the information that's given to us. And if we no longer trust that information because it's been invalidated as part of a political strategy, then it, it's to, to kind of paraphrase GK Chesterton, uh, uh, along the, the notion along the lines that, well, if people give up belief in God, then it's not that they believe nothing, it's that they'll believe anything. But in actual fact, if people no longer believe the official institutions of a society are reliable, then they will believe anything. And this is where the interface, I think, with the new technology is extremely powerful. Um, it's this confluence of different technologies of cognitive influence, socially implemented at scale with an unprecedented intensity. And so the the fact that so many Americans, uh, people around the world actually in different democracies, but so many Americans inhabit a kind of emergency at the moment in the way they construe the world, a stolen election, uh, cabals of satanistic pedophiles, um, nefarious sort of Marxist Black Lives Matter type movements and so on. The fact that 
the, these emergency signals are constantly being propagated and producing this feeling of collective crisis, coupled with the breakdown of trust in the key institution of the society, is an absolutely febrile combination. Because it's, it, 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 there is an issue about how to regulate the media, but there is also a question of how do you row back from this once this new set of facts is established. And the additional problem, of course, is the lack of will on the part of senior American politicians, perhaps mostly on the Republican side, to actually confront this and adjust their discourse and to own the consequences of the political strategies that they're pursuing. Peter, on the on the question of institutions um, and uh, information flows and, and um, media, I mean, the BBC is an interesting case study right now, isn't it? Obviously, I mean, it's, you know, a media organisation which is wedded to public service values, but is under quite a lot of attack currently in terms of trust. Um, I mean, is there is there a way an institution like that can change its metaphor in the way that you you referred to earlier? Do you think, or is it just once it's set in once this is set in train, it's it's um, it's a lot. It's you know it's very difficult to regain that trust. Um, so so the um, so the BBC's trust is still incredibly high. Um, but but um, and we saw that in the pandemic. The problem is no one's watching it in a certain generation. So what it risks is, um, um, is a sort of PBSization among the younger generation. Um, it's actually about going back to its original metaphor. I think Reith's original vision is completely, is the one that is now actually inspiring the movement for civic tech in the US. The idea that the idea of public media is not just doing, I don't know, boring news that nobody else does. The idea of public service media is to bring forth the public. Yeah, playing off this old distinction that you find in Mills and a lot of American sort of theorists of the 50s and 60s, sort of the dynamic between a mass, which is manipulable and angry, and the public full of sort of um, active citizenry. So their definition of, of mass and public, not the one from the 1920s, which is very different. But that kind of one between, between um, um, the mob and the mass and, 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 the, and the kind of democratic public. So that was Reith's original idea. The whole idea of the BBC is that it would usher in this, this common, common democratic discourse, which is pluralistic yet quite cohesive. Um, so when people are now redesigning the internet and think about the future of the internet in America, they're thinking about, they're quoting Reith a lot. Yeah, and they're going back to their original mission. How do we create social media platforms which are not based on sucking your data, fueling the, uh, the, the sort of values that I talked about uh, in my little meander this morning, but which are geared around creating um, um, a, a democratic public discourse. Um, so listen, they're thinking about that in America now, actually very clever at the BBC, people at the BBC thought about this in the 1990s, and there was a movement in the BBC to pioneer a public, what we would now call a social media, yeah? So not the content, but actually design that space. And they were told to stop it by the Blair government because, uh, or so the story goes, I should say, so the story goes at, at, at the pubs around the BBC, um, uh, uh, they were told to stop it by the Blair government because it would uh, get in the way of the market. Um, one of the many, 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 three or four horrible decisions that the Blair government made, I think that now is one of them as well. Um, and, and no, it's completely the BBC philosophy, but we have to translate that into the design of our digital space. Um, and the BBC didn't make that leap into digital. They're still thinking about digital as a sort of linear broadcaster. Let's put a piece of something everywhere which is just misreading what we're in. You know, you've got to be embedded in the design of the thing. That's the key. Um, and then the content will, will layer on top of that. So, um, and it is about engagement, you know, what would be the BBC engagement? So no, I mean, social media, if done correctly, would be <clears throat> the, the great sort of articulation of the Rethian vision, not as a metaphor for public service media, a of the BBC is a, a metaphor for society. That's what it was. It was meant to be these kind of stand-ins for different bits of society. He could actually have real engagement. You know, this is the dream that Reith had. We're so close to it, but um, let's blame it all on Blair. He fucked it up. Well, that's an interesting corrective about trust in BBC being very high. That might be an example of, of um misinformation flows. You, wouldn't, you would, certainly wouldn't believe that uh, 
reading no, the there's news. There's a small group of right wing nutters, but and then they've maybe grown. But no, overall, it's still like by far the most trusted media. I think I think in Europe and probably the world. Okay, there's a question that's come in from Monadili, but um, which is around. Um, Manipulation of populations by third states is a real and present danger, considering all that's been said today and what's going on in the world. Is this a new conflict frontier and what are the requisite uh, defenses? Um, so this is, yeah, this is a question really about um, third states getting, getting caught up, manipulated in, in these um, processes of uh, misinformation flows. Anyone want to take that? Peter? I'm a, I'm a bit worried that I'm monopolizing the discussion here. I mean, it, this is basically like 50% of my job is to look at this stuff, though. I'll try to be brief. Okay. Um, if we're looking for a metaphor, um, we're talking about metaphors a lot today. If we're looking for a metaphor about the information wars that we're all very worried about and, and hostile state activity, it's not a Cold War metaphor. It's not about, oh, Russia coming to challenge the in American information space. It is much more the wars of religion in, in, in the late Middle Ages. Um, it's everybody's at it. So yes, definitely states like Russia and China can do a hell of a lot. Um, but there's also, it, it literally is companies, extremist groups, people just doing it in their spare time because it's so cheap and easy. We are mercenaries crossing sides all the time. When we did the last German election, we found loads of these mercenaries. They'll do something for the Russians. They'll do something for the far right. They'll do something for the Brits. They don't care. Um, individuals can be mercenaries, can go and do their own little campaign. It's, it's, it's the wars of religion, everyone against everyone out there. Obviously states can do a huge amount of damage. They have resources. Um, they can do lots of things, but, but it, I, I really wouldn't. It's, it's a real war of all against all out there. Thanks. Gareth, there's also, I think, a question from Dr. Graham Kidd. Was that, was that addressed? Um, thank you. Thanks, Quentin. Uh, I think this is, a, this is the question, yes, that's right, about um, the tendency to short-term emotional immediate survival. Um, so it's a question, I think, about learning emotional control or know thy, you know, the, the know thyself uh, principle. Um, anyone want to take that question? That, you know the, the centrality of that of that. I mean, I could that. I could comment on that briefly. Um, it, just to just to say that uh, it it does raise the question of how people in this new environment can be better equipped to manage the, the the kind of information that they're confronted with um and i think this is actually genuinely the world is a more complicated place uh politically informationally um and the it, it's not really the it's not just the volume of information but it's actually the uh the difficulties posed to the individual of interpreting it uh, and of course much of that information is subtle in its effect this goes beyond sort of 1990s type spin it, it it it's a the whole design of our information environment now is in, insidiously and expertly controlled to capture attention the so-called attention economy and that becomes a vehicle not just for commerce but also for politics and for religion and so on and we are confronted I think we're confronted with a level of expertise in the design of these environments that actually um, means that it's difficult to monitor, check, verify the, the, the scale uh, at which we're being influenced. Now that may sound like a sort of rather paranoid orientation to the world, but actually I, I think it's I think it's where we've got to. Um, so there's an interesting question here about, obviously there's a question, well, how do you design the internet for it to be a safer space for people? 
a psychologically healthier space for people, a safer space for children, a safer space politically. And that, of course, is then locating that challenge with regulators and content providers. But there's an interesting question here about how people now can learn skills to actually manage, to, um, to improve their own management uh, of the kind of uh, environment that we now inhabit. Um, so this is across all domains. I mean, th this would include sexual behavior, the evolution of internet pornography, for example, the massive effect that has upon people's sexual development, the way they think about sexual behavior. Um, but in the domain of politics, in the domain of religion, in the domain of commerce, in the domain of body image, um, in the domain of uh, ostracism, exclusion, bullying, etc., it, it's there's there are many fronts operating simultaneously, um, and so it, it, it may be an aspiration. Maybe it's more of an aspiration to equip people with skills to manage this, because in actual fact, the power of where of what we're confronting uh, plays to psychological vulnerabilities and propensities uh, of our makeup. Um, and so it, it, it's, a, it, it's an important question anyway. It's, um, what I'm doing is I think I'm describing a problem rather than pr proposing a solution, but it's, I, I think it's a, an issue. But given that there are these problems, I mean, you know, the tendency towards forms of extreme paranoia, for example, that the internet, all these new social media structures can create in the way you've talked about, Quinton, or, or pathological group processes, or, or maybe even just extreme theatricality, which it seems to be, Peter, what, some of what you were describing. Um, what, what, what role do you think psychiatry, psychology can have in um in remedies is there a role or is it just a, a sort of a kind of bystander uh position where you're, where you're watching you know the sink ship the, the ship sink so to speak what, what would be the what would be the um the front foot to get on do you think in terms of the perspective from psychiatry psychology including group understanding of group psychology would you just feel or would you just feel captured by a, a sort of as a, a mood of pessimism, Quinton. Am I captured by pessimism? Um, I, I think, well, let me, so I, when I was thinking about this talk and reading more and more about QAnon and so on, uh, it, I don't know whether, Eli, you may know this book, uh, Norman Cohn's Pursuit of the Millennium. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's like reading about millenarianism. There's a, there's a millenarian atmosphere about politics. Um, and it's odd because of course the other, I mean, just to follow off on from a, 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 a point, really a question to Eli earlier, I, there's a very odd reversal that has occurred in crowd psychology. Because I think, I mean, there is a debate about what the relationship is between a group of people, a physical, a physically located group of people and membership of a group. Um, so, for example, those who identify as belonging to a particular group historically, has that tended to be, uh, whose group membership tended to depend on association, physical association, so that the group is identified with the people capable of associating. Um, here, we are now into something very different where the, the, the point of a Trump rally, for example, or any type of political rally, is not the few hundred people or few thousand people that gather in an air car, aircraft hangar. Uh, it's that is the televisual or image illustration of a much larger constituency that is digitally assembled. Um, and so we're in this odd situation that we see these kind of markers, these out sort of outgrowth sort of popping out of the woodwork of particular groups of kind of anti-vaxxers or right-wing agitators coming at political march and so on but actually they they are little tips of gigantic icebergs that sort of momentarily materialize and so this phenomenon is the spatial distribution and covertness of this phenomenon i think is 
different because what we have every single night on the internet, we've got the equivalent of a Nuremberg rally and we've got the equivalent of an ISIS gathering and we've got the equivalent of X and Y and Z and it's all spatially distributed. It, it's very different, but there is a ferment of ideas and a ferment of reorganization of identity and political affiliations and political motivations and religious motivations. Um, and it, 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 I think it, so I don't want to be uh, sort of, I don't want to sound like a prophet of doom, but actually reading about this, it, if the figures are true, they're astonishing. They are astonishing. You know, for example, the prevalence of the number of Americans who accept the basic premise of QAnon. How did that happen that, where are we? Um, 75 years or something after the end of World War II, that there is a version of the blood libel uh, circulating amongst such large numbers of people. It, it's an extraordinary situation. I don't know, Eli or Peter, whether you share my sense of uh, that we're into something new at the moment and we're in a, a, a kind of politically febrile, a socially febrile state. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I do. Um, but I wouldn't uh, explain it by the digital. Um, I, um, I mean, when you, you know, when you study history, obviously, you know, it's just full of craziness and, and mass, crazy mass movements and so forth. So that's not exactly new. But um, when I, you know, when I study history, um, you know, um, let, let's take the question of the public uh, that Peter raised before. How do you, how do you, this is like, a, a long, I was thinking about that after Peter spoke, you know, how do you establish a sort of quasi-rational uh, public sphere of the sort that John Dewey, for example, argued against Walter Lippmann that in a democratic society, this was possible because uh, there are enough social institutions to support some sort of rational debate. This is another way, in other words, instead of focusing on the crazy movements, the QAnons and so forth, which you're right, are you know, massive. Let's look at uh, the supposedly non-crazy. Um, why are they, I would pose the question this way, not why has there been such a gr growth in irrational mass movements, but why has the supposedly rational public sphere become uh, so weak in giving society a center and giving leadership um, and so forth. Uh, and, I, and I do think that it has become weaker um, in the last uh, 30 years or so. And, and I do think it has to do, this is again, uh, very off the cuff, so to speak and undeveloped, but I do think it, I do think that there's a basic change in capitalism. I do think if you look at modern society, what drives everything is capitalism, seriously. I mean, starting in the 18th century, 19th century, it's such an overwhelming force. And I don't mean economics, I don't, I don't mean just income, but the whole structure of society and the values, the work ethic, uh, the changes in the nature of the family, whether women are working and so forth, this is all, coming out of something that basically functions automatically. It functions without, it has a logic of its own. Um, you know, it's a social, it's a, it's, it's a, 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 you know, a dynamic social structure that is constantly transforming. It's destroying villages, it's connecting up people, it's creating, you know, containerization, globalization, uh, you know, the steamship in the, the trans-oceanic cable in the 19th century and uh, so forth. This is all coming out of some machine, some huge machine at the center of society. Now, until let's say the 1970s or so, um, the struggle to establish a rational public sphere 
um, had to do with a kind of, to, to, I'm a teacher, so you need a framework to have a rational public sphere. You, you need to establish certain parameters. What are we talking about? What are our assumptions and so forth because, before you can have a, a rational discussion? And let's say from the 18th century or so until let's say the 1970s, the framework was economic development. And you could argue against what seemed to be irrational forms of economic development uh, because you could say they're, they're not necessary. We can have democratic economic development. Uh, so, um, you know, for example, Hitler was all about turning um, Germany into a kind of uh, Germanic version of the New Deal, including immigration restriction and racial Jim Crow, uh, but also, um, you know, a house for everybody, a car for everybody. Uh, and, and so forth. But then you could argue against, but to, to do that, you needed to expand. You needed land, Lebensraum and so forth. And that's why Germany went to war. But you could say rationally, well, you don't really, you, you could have a, a, a successful German society without being expansionist. You don't really have to, and that's what people did in Germany after World War II. They created a successful economy without conquering Eastern Europe. They just conquered the markets of Eastern Europe, they didn't have to conquer uh, the land. Um, and similarly, uh, with communism, Keynes made, uh, you know, he said, he said as a system of running, running an economy or running a society, communism is a failure, but to destroy an economy, it's fantastic. Uh, and and um, he made an argument against socialism, which was always a very plausible argument to me. Uh, and he said, um, in order to develop, you have to expropriate a surplus. Uh, and capitalism does it through the profit system. Uh, communism does it, uh, does it through the state. But, um, you know, what we do by expropriating it through the profit system is we reinvest the surplus and we build trains, we build factories, we build steel mills. And so we developed the economy. And if we just uh, taxed everybody and took money away and gave everybody a little money, we wouldn't be able to do that. So it's really very efficient to have a capitalist class that, uh, you know, that develops the economy. And, yeah, and then you could argue, isn't it taking too much? And so when that created a kind of quasi rational framework for a public sphere, well into the 1970s. And I think the changes in capitalism since then, uh, in which we don't create trains and we don't build trains and, and things that everybody can agree upon, but in which everything is centered in finance and finance is, does not necessarily lead to anything except, except the expansion of finance. Um, I think that that uh, kind of, eviscerates uh, the material basis uh, for the kind of politics, which was social democratic politics, New Deal politics, that had plenty of irrationality to it, to be sure. But still, there was a kind of core agreement about, about economic development. And I think it's the elimination of that um, creates a kind of vacuum and, and, and the digital functions in that vacuum. All right, can I, thank you, Eli. So just it, it, having set out that argument or created that framework, I just want to raise a question which I think I alluded to earlier, which I'd be interested for your views on actually also Peter's as well, is that is the question of the, of the organizing principles or ideas under panic, uh, underpinning political discourse now. Um, and I'm thinking particularly uh, of what we might call identitarianism and culture wars. And two observations. So one is, it, there is a question actually, is the extent to which these political orientations have gained additional traction uh, because of the digital space 
uh, they actually is a style of politics which lends itself very well to propagation through the digital space. Um, but whether or not um, it provides a perspective for these rapid um, aberrations in what people think about the world. So for example, what I'm, so here's an idea. It's, it is perhaps odd to believe that there is a cabal of uh, paedophiles running the world or running the country. But if it's regarded as a metaphor, it's also a way of saying that you don't like the people who are running the country and you don't trust them. And I think a lot of what is happening is I think what happens in beliefs that people accept is essentially their metaphors that people then take concretely. So, so I think the, it, it, if the concrete conceptual content of the propositions are treated as metaphors, they tell us a lot about what people are thinking. Now, the, so then that also, so that's one observation. The other observation is it, it's to do with why is politics now organized around identity in a way which is largely disconnected from issues of socio-economic socio um, circumstances in the way that was, say, you know, when I was a boy, um, when people spoke about politics, they had arguments about um, the rate of tax and how much wealth should be redistributed and whether or not there should be social ownership or whether or not it's better to let private prop, uh, you know, entrepreneurs create wealth. I mean, those sorts of debates have more or less, well, they seem antiquated now, maybe. Um, it, it, it seems as a, the, the space now is, is dominated by a different style of politics. So I just want to seek both of your views on that, the relationship between identity-based politics, culture wars, and the new information environment, uh, and its relationship to what you're talking about, Eli, as well, which is the, if you like, the underlying conditions of people's lives. Mm -hmm. You want to go, Peter? Well, Gary? Um, yeah. Um... Okay, let's find a couple of things from what you said, which I think are very important. So we need to be careful about thinking that conspiracy theories are just about epistemology and under explaining the world. They can be, but with a lot of QAnon people, the polling we have, and the polling isn't great, is that most people don't even know the precepts of Q. It's about being in a group. And that's why people flick through their, their conspiracy theories. One week it's Duma, the next week it's um, something else, then it's Q, Q came out of Pizzagate, tomorrow will be something else. It changes. This conspiratorial, you know, the, the group identity building seems to be as important, if not more important than the epistemological need to explain the world or whatever. So I think that's very important. And look, that makes sense, you know, I'm Jewish, I go to synagogue, I don't know the 618 mitzvot and neither do I plan to. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not that unusual for us to think about it that way. Um, so, um, so, 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 so that's very important. Why, why now? Um, I mean, it was very interesting interviewing sociologists and pollsters whose job it is to identify social groups and then use that knowledge in political targeting. This is their bread and butter, you know, they're, 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 I don't think sort of pollsters or, or, or spin doctors are necessarily that geniuses, but they work on the kind of, they work in the reality of what, what motivates people um, and the practical side of these things. And, and they say, they tell me the same things everywhere, whether it's Russia or England or America, we used to have st stable social groups. We used to target people by their class, by the newspapers they read, by where they lived, by their economic desires, we could tell where they were. And that's crumbled. You know, now we're going online, some people looking for psychographics, which is a part bullshit pseudoscience in terms of reading people's psychological groups. 
um, or they're going online, just finding little things that they're into and trying to work out which of those little things, toenail fetishes or something, are the things to get to them at. This comes back to what Gillian was talking about. So, you know, in that swirl, in that, you know, if we're going to use the capitalistic thing, what Zygmunt Bauman called liquid modernity, where all these old relationships are breaking down, maybe partly powered by a certain variant of very weird liquid capitalism. Um, in that loss, people, people, you know, creating identity as a political thing becomes your job. Um, this guy that I talked to in Mexico, well, well-known Latin American spin doctor, says, that is my job. My job is for every election to create a new political identity, usually around a new idea of the people. Yeah. They're doing this on the left as well. This is what Mouf, Chantal Mouffe is talking about all the time, the need to create the people as a strategy, populism as a strategy in this kind of gloopy, unstable state. So that becomes your job, including for the identitarians. How do you take these very private, tiny fetishes and needs, which are often nothing to do with the public, and somehow bring them together for a moment into a political identity? By the oldest tricks in the book, creating an enemy, being terribly vague, I mean, if we're talking about the Nazis, this is the Nazis in the 1920s up to their electoral success. This is not the indoctrination Nazis from 33. This is the first bit of the Nazis when they basically paid 20 different cards. You know, there's a, you know, William Shira talks about how Hitler is completely different with different audiences and has a different message to different audiences. This is the populist Nazis. They're not even that anti-Semitic in some, in some circles. So that's your job. And that's what you do. That's what you, all your energy is towards. And that's the demand in society. The thing that's very interesting is very liquid. It kind of comes together. Very interesting looking at Italy with the Cinque Stella movement, the, the populist movement. They, they brought all these very different energies together. You do it through targeting very different groups with different messages. You, cut, you bring them together. Of course, the, the Achilles heel, it's very hard to govern because you have 20 million messages you send out to different people. You constantly have to stay in this stage of like keeping people in flame through the search of enemies. So we get, you know, it, it sounds like a very toxic circle. You've got this demand for people to, to have an identity and you've got political actors taking advantage. The good news, the good news. So we do a lot of polling and social research looking to what extent these identity issues are actually what people care about. And they're not. We just did research in Hungary, which shows that most people don't care about all the all bad lines. Now, that doesn't mean the identity stuff isn't important. My sense is a lot of the culture war can be, not always, but can be kind of a compensation for something else. People in, Russian speakers in Ukraine don't actually give, don't actually care about the Stalin statues. Yeah? You know, when they, then these fights about, do you pull down statues? It's not about that. It's about a lot of other discomfort, a lot of other needs that's being then kind of taken into the culture war as a metaphor for these deep needs. And I, I think our mission is, we can't just go back to saying, oh, the price of fish. There are deep psychological needs that need to be addressed. Our job is, I mean, from where I'm coming from, which is public media, is, is to work out what those issues are and start bringing them into public speech. So talking, coming back to something concrete, I used to work in telly. We used to pitch, early 2000s, we used to pitch programs all the time about immigration. Uh, the company I worked for even came up with a lovely sort of reality show format called um, um, uh, My Polish Boss, which would be all about Brit British working class people working for a poll and getting into these relationships because they were starting to fester in society. Channel 4 was like, oh, we can't touch immigration. Too dangerous. You don't touch these issues, they will be capitalized by a propagandist who will use them. So, so our job is to really take these you know, these, you know, insecurities that people feel in this ish, this period of liquid modernity, if you're going to use that phrase, and start to deal with them before the propagandist gets them. We've got some questions coming in now from, I, um, from others, so it'd be nice I, to see those in, but Eli, Eli do you want to, do you want to say something now, perhaps briefly, because we're, we're, we're starting to come towards the end. Yeah, um, I, I can hold it. I'll, I'll say it uh, later. Okay. Um, well, there are two two questions. They're quite they're, they're kind of question slash comments. So I'm gonna I'm gonna fray, I'm gonna kind of shorten them a bit. That's all right. So what one is a question from Julia Bland, uh, and it's really it's asking is this really as new as all that? 
um, and Julia quotes Shakespeare, Henry the Fourth, Part Two. I won't read it all out, but it's, I guess maybe Eli, could you respond respond to this? I mean, as a historian, is this really as new as all that? I mean, yeah. you could have said yes, um, but can we just press you a bit more on that? Is it really as new as all that? Is that are we just finding new ways of of um, dealing with human nature? No, I mean. Uh, yeah, no, we're we're definitely in a new uh, in a new situation. Basically, since the nineteen seventies, we're definitely um, in a new situation. Um, and of course, there are permanent factors of the human condition: uh, and irrationality, unconscious, uh, you know, with, uh, et cetera. So you definitely will find conspiracy thinking and and paranoia and uh, you know etc throughout uh, throughout history so that's true and we can learn a lot and I tried to use Plato before and so forth I mean ancient Greece which is where all of our demo political theory comes from was basically a group they didn't even have a state there was no bureaucracy they were just a male group and their political theory is group psychology uh, so yeah, there are there are permanent factors, but uh, ancient Greece was new, and our situation since the 1970s is new, even though we have a lot in common with them. Okay, thanks. Now there's another question that's come in. Again, I'm going to paraphrase it. This one, I'm going to put this one to you, Peter. Um, so this is really this is from George Schmuckler, say, identifying difficulties around regulating the digital space. So would not be a better approach around to, to focus on education, perhaps early, early education, uh, around the question of teaching people, how can I decide what to believe or what might perhaps be called critical thinking. So push on critical thinking in schools. And then the other is an idea from Martha Nussbaum the philosopher about national surge service. So would it be a good idea to introduce a non-military national service that would bring people together, young persons from di diverse backgrounds and help build a sense of social sol solidarity? So what do you think about that? Those two, are those good ideas, good remedies? Peter. That's oh, me. Um, oh, national service to know. I've got a troublesome 14 year old. So probably definitely send her to the territorial army. Um, I, I don't know. I've lived in countries where they have national service. It seemed a good idea. It seemed to work fine in Germany. I, I don't know. It, these things are so dependent on your culture. I don't know. It's like uh, it, it can work. I don't know if it'll work in, in England or America. Um, so um, in terms of um, the, the, the regulation thing. No, no, no. I think with regulation, we do have to think about regulation. And let's connect it to critical thinking. You cannot critically think about a black box. The internet is a black box at the moment. You don't know when you look at your Facebook feed, what is quality or non-quality uh, information. Yeah? To do that, we'd have to have regulation that tells you where it's coming from, who's paid for it, how much money have they spent, Who's behind it? Why? They, which of your data has been used to target it? For you to have critical engagement with this environment, you have to have enough information to start doing that. At the moment, we're like Taliban on Prospero's Island, surrounded by these weird information noises, not understanding where they're coming from. So for us to have critical engagement individually and as a society, we need regulation that makes it more transparent. Yeah? Regulating speech is a no-go. That's never going to get anywhere. We know that. I mean, that's that's a... I mean, that's, that's just philosophically impossible. But regulating the design, the system, how it's set up, how much you know about it, that is, at the moment, it is arranged, frankly, in an authoritarian way. Frankly, it's arranged in a way that we are constantly being experimented on all the time, yeah, by tech companies, nonstop, without any control or knowledge. Yeah. Um, Work going back to Karl Popper, he had a lot of ideas about how social engineering, and this is social engineering I'm talking about, it's actually a necessity in an advanced democracy, but it has to be open. Or everything Facebook is doing should be reviewed by civic tech engineers, reviewed by the public, all of this has to be open. So I, I'd be careful about thinking that education is a way out. You have to be, have something to analyze first. You can't analyze a black box. Peter, could I just, could, while you're, talking uh, if you could just speak briefly on what we should do or can do about algorithms 
and also just you mentioned popper uh eli may have you on this the open society and its enemies and the the role of free speech in the digital age and how to think about that so it, i mean i know we're on the home stretch now but i th yeah, those yeah. seem to be quite fundamental questions here peter can you with haiku like brevity can you address yeah. the two questions Okay, I mean, we should do a whole session on the algorithms. Algorithms are just computer programs. That's all they are. It's just a really flash word for a computer program. The computer programs which define our world should be regulated and have public oversight. We've started to fetish, I don't know, if, I'm not gonna use the word fetishize around Freud experts. We've started to sort of use this term algorithm in a ridiculous way. And it reminds me a little bit of sort of H.G. Wells novels about the evil robots and the evil algorithms that are coming to get us, which are all, I would think from a Freudian point of view, of course, our kind of our way of talking about the nastiest sides of our societies and ourselves. I mean, where it's a bit like sort of like the machines are coming and it's just us and it's the algorithms are coming. Look, the algorithms are just designed by us. They show the nastiest bits of our society. They show up its racism, its inequalities, and it's, you know, weird authoritarian and abusive capitalist and totalitarian instincts. Let's stop blaming it on the algorithms. It's humans creating computer programs. We can regulate them. Can I jump in, uh, Gareth, do you have a moment? Uh, I think if we start to we start to wrap up now, if we just sort of think about starting have to... final statements. Yeah. I wanted to um, go back uh, to Quentin's uh, question about uh, the increase in identity uh, politics in our time and what its relationship is to the socioeconomic structure, because I definitely think uh, there's a relationship. And um, the I, I keep trying to um, direct the discussion away from the digital toward the um, social context in which the digital is functioning and especially you know the public the the kind of discourses or public sphere or absence of public sphere that is outside of the uh, digital what its relationship to the digital is and uh, so forth um now on the question of identity um we take nationalism as a paradigmatic case the nation and mostly, obviously very complicated question, but to a great extent, nationalism is a late 19th century phenomenon for most of Europe and then for the mm -hmm. colonial world and so forth. It's led by intellectuals, it's invented. It's an invented tradition as Hobsbawm says. The intellectuals go back, they find um, literature, folk tales, uh, they create peasant museums. They create a whole story uh, about the nation. Now, why does that work? It works because these nations are entering into a capitalist world market and they have to position themselves in relationship and they need national markets. So the bourgeoisies in these different nations, whether they be Hungary or Czech or India, uh, the bourgeoisies in these nations need national markets. Why is the United States so successful economically? There are several reasons, but one is it has this incredible national market. Why is China so successful? Same reason. So nationalism develops at a time when you get nation states that organize economies and you have intellectuals leading the way. You create national literatures. You create, uh, you know, um, characters and so forth that, and you compete different literatures, English literature, Russian literature, and so forth, uh, between the nations uh, and so forth. Now, what is the situation today? What is the situation since the 1970s? Intellectuals are totally disconnected from uh, their nations. They are global. Their ideology is entirely based on meritocracy, which is to say that they believe that they are superior. They believe that their interest is in defending what they think of as rationality, intellectuality, and so forth. They have no loyalty to their national groups. And by intellectuals, I'm talking about a quarter of the population. I'm not talking about narrow strata. I'm talking about very large numbers of, uh, of um uh, of people. They have basically abandoned the mass of people. 
that really leaves that mass of people open to any kind of craziness that comes along and so forth of which tribal things and identifications that are based on anything, uh, uh, conspiracy theories, outside, inside, paranoia, and so forth, uh, is, is the field is wide open to that kind of thing when you have the situation that we have in the developed world of intellectuals who uh, basically are pursuing policies that benefit them and don't be benefit the nation uh, and uh, pursuing an ideology that exalts them and, and basically looks down on most uh, ordinary people as irrational, paranoid conspiracy, followers of conspiracy theory. Mm. Yeah, thank you. You know, that's, a, that's powerful. That's powerful. I think closing statement. Do we have any other closing, sort of more closing things we want to say, Quentin, Peter? So I think we're now, I think we're now sort of wrapping up. Any sort of final reflections? I, well, uh, I thought topic today. Yeah, I, just briefly, I think, uh, Eli, your comments are very uh, interesting. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I suspect that traditional political policy can't actually remedy the problems, by which I mean um, it is difficult to know what kind of, for example, you know, a traditional political approach to this might be to work out what the needs are of particular groups who are effectively radicalized and detached from uh, from what otherwise might be regarded as reality. And so the difficulty here is that I do think there is a kind of, as I describe it as a runaway phenomenon, I think there's a sort of autonomous self-propagating quality to what's going on now with multiple <coughs> confluence of factors. So for example, because the, uh, be because two things. One, the groups cut across social classes. So there's no doubt that there's huge distress and suffering in American society. There's no doubt about that. But actually addressing that through policy doesn't translate into these coalitions that are forming. It might address the needs of some of them, but it won't address the needs of all of them because it's not actually sufficiently explained by people's socioeconomic circumstances. So in other words, there needs to be, to, to reinforce Peter's point, I think part of the remedy has actually got to be regulatory to do with information. This is about information at one level. It's also about suffering, uh, but that's not a sufficient explanation. Um, so I think, so that, that is, so that's an observation really that I would, uh, uh, that I would make. It's also, it's, it's a point that uh, others have made as well. Mark Danner made it in his article about the called Reality Rebellion, the New York Review of Books. Um, I don't think there's a conventional, so I think this is beyond the conventional political toolkit um, to address, even though uh, addressing social distress and inequality and so on is, is important. Thank, thanks, thanks, Quinton. Peter, some final Final reflections. I, mean, I think we talked a little. We started to talk about remedies, which is which is the you know the great challenge, and it's it's, it's at all levels. It's regulatory. It's reinventing media. It's designing new digital spaces. It's addressing socioeconomic issues. It's a lot of stuff to do. But um, I keep on thinking about what what have been the you know if take back control with both its socioeconomic and its you know idealized super ego drives is is has been the catchphrase of the illiberal populists. Then I, I wonder what, what, what have we seen already as interesting other forces? And a couple of people have mentioned, you know, um, the crowd as a positive um, in terms of the two examples that are always used, the Black Lives Matter and Me Too. I think we'd look, want to look at that a lot more. Did they actually, were they optimally organized um, on the social media platforms we have now? Could they have been better organized uh, with more positive um, and less... Uh, less, you don't know, less effects for being hacked, which they were in so many ways. Um, so that's very, very important to think about. How do we, what are the conditions for good social movements to put uh, collective action, um, collective action forward? 
and how do we design spaces for that to happen? I think that would be a really interesting thing to think about. But look, the last, the last, even though we've all been paying attention to the liberal populace, the last four or five years have also seen an incredible amount of protests across the world, which we've really struggled to join up. So 1989, you know, all the protests seemed part of one big wave of democratization in South Africa, Eastern Europe, obviously Latin America, even, even Southeast Asia. Actually, the last four or five years, we've seen huge protests in Hong Kong, in Chile, um, all across Africa and successful ones in Africa, um, parts of Eastern Europe, Georgia, there's a lot. We're not working out what's in common between them. It's clearly not the old logic of democratization because they're very different societies. I'd like to go and investigate those movements. I think, I suspect that the, exactly, the real counterweight to the liberal, uh, to the liberal populists of these protest movements everywhere. Let's go investigate them. Let's understand what's driving them. I actually suspect it is weirdly also about identity because the old things that represented people don't feel enough anymore, whether it's parties or labor unions or the CCP or whatever, um, they don't feel represented, but they're coming out, they're fighting for, their, for, for, for an abundance of different rights, um, but they're literally taking back control. Yeah, and we have to think about, you know, these active democratic crowds and what, what is it that they have in common with each other? We might need to refresh our language. I don't think we can just put it into the ban now banal uh, matrix of you know voting rights and freedom of expression something much more subtle no one's done that I was just going to do a big research project going around the world interviewing people and then COVID struck um, yeah. so maybe I need to get back to that but I think we've got to look for the these positive social movements and take our energy from them it definitely won't be solved by a bunch of technocratic price of fish sort of measures just very you know just very quickly i totally agree with you peter uh and i do think that that is a, a key way to go and if you look at these two movements in the united states black lives matter and uh, me too i actually think black lives matter is a more rational and grounded movement even though you know i support both movements but i do think that there are a lot of differences and the difference is black lives matter is actually grounded in communities uh, actual face-to-face -face people living together and so forth. And I think Me Too is much more uh, media uh, driven. It's not, you know, I mean, women are not a community, they're a group. And so, you know, so uh, something to think about. Okay, well, it's nice to find that positive ending that there have been, there have been examples of social- Can I, can I give a last second? That have looked healthy. <laughs> can I give a okay. last second to what you like? When yeah. I said, it's about how every good thing can be hacked. And basically hacking is the great metaphor of our time. Ideologies being hacked, planes being hacked, cyber infrastructure being hacked, language being hacked. Um, you know, the right wing now use the language of liberals. And when I was covering the last election, I went round with the conservative candidates in Northern England and they were knocking on doors. And people kept on saying, these were swing voters who could move from Labour to Conservative. They kept on saying, well, we really care about our community. Community is really important to us. We really want you to care about our community. Yeah. And at one point, I but one point I asked the guy, like, what do they mean by communities? Like, oh, they just don't want any foreigners here. <laughs> so <laughs> community. Right. 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 Okay. All right. Um, well, I think we're gonna finish now. We're, we're a bit over. And I think you know it's been a long, it's been a long, very interesting um webinar. I think we've definitely met our our um well, we aim to sort of broaden out the discussion of power and, power and personality. And we've we've most certainly done that. So thank you very much to our speakers, Peter, Quinton, yep. Eli, and, and Gillian from earlier. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, just a few very small things to close on. Uh, so thanks, particularly to Quinton. Actually, this was uh, he very much led from the front on pulling this this webinar together. So thank you, Quinton. Um, and also thanks to the other people in the in the group, in the Wall Street philosophy groups. That's Rob Harlan, Peter Garrard, Lisa Conlan, Felix Warnock, um, Elisa Brown, and Tom Prater. So thanks to them. Uh, of course, you know, running these sorts of things is we we you know it's free. These events are free, but they're not free to produce. Um, so if you have, you know, taken some stimulation from this uh, and interest, then please do consider making a donation to the charity. Uh, which you can do very easily on our website. If you just Google Maudsley Philosophy Group, you'll, you'll get to the right place. Uh, and there's, it's now in the chat um, if, you, if you need that too. 
Now, just to say that a recording of the whole webinar will be on the website soon. Uh, so if there are bits that you've missed or you want to share the, 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 um, you know, the webinar with others, it will be up on, on, the, on the website there. Um, and you know, we, encourage, we encourage this to be, to be shared because we're wanting to try to, to develop this, this broader discussion. Well, with that, I think we will end. And um, so everybody can get up, have a stretch, have a refresh, but, uh, but move on to, to, um, you know, to new thoughts on this topic. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll certainly be going away and reflecting on how to establish new, new connections and ideas for, for seminars and webinars and, and whatnot. So with that, we'll, we'll, we'll say goodbye. And um, I'm very grateful for everybody's input. Thank you, Gareth, as well. Yeah. Bye, Bye, everybody. Eli and Peter. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Thank you.